So, <laughs> this film, uh, hmm, this is the last pre-Disney film. I know what you're thinking. Laura, this came out in 2006. Yeah, the delay happened as a direct result of some negotiation issues. After Eisner bowed out and Incredibles happened, which I discussed over in that rumination, we had a bit where it's like, huh, how do we, uh, how do we move forward with Disney? And just about everyone involved was like, screw Disney. We're done. We're out. We're, we're done with them. They've messed with us for the last time. Cars is the last contractually obligated thing. Once we're done with that, let's get on with this. Maybe work with some other publishing companies out there. And they actually, this is the funny thing. They announced that they were seeking other public, uh, publishing uh, studios, but they weren't. There is no evidence of them actually reaching out and connecting to anyone other than Disney. It was probably just a negotiations tactic. The problem is Pixar didn't make that decision, really. The money people make these kind of decisions. That's why they're called the money people. They're the ones who actually decide things. And the money people, Steve Jobs especially, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, they were like, well, Eisner's out. This new buddy, Bob Iger, he's in. Why don't we give him a chance? We'll we'll let him kind of work something out here, and we'll figure it out. By the way, I, I erroneously in a previous video mentioned that Ratatouille was the last part of the deal. It was actually Cars. That's my bad. I was screwing up the names because Ratatouille is the first time when things would be under the new label. That's that's what I, I meant. And I retraction and correction. <clears throat> that's the last thing we're going to talk about that until we move forward just a little bit into Ratatouille. But this was the last Disney, uh, excuse me, pre-Disney Pixar film. Everything after this will be produced while Pixar has been procured by Disney, uh, for better and for worse. Now, as usual, uh, they had a big research thing, uh, researching into both Formula One and NASCAR, looking into Route 66. Not only the construction of cars, but the, the methods by which cars were painted. All of this was stuff they were looking into to try and make this, as usual, as realistic as possible. And in fact, frankly, they did an excellent job here. For what I believe is now like the third time, <laughs> they had another little animation bump that I didn't know about. This would be on the lighting side of things. Because they designed it in such a way that the cars... Uh, so... Do you remember in Finding Nemo, there's a bit where Dory is flapping. It's right towards the end of the film. It's why it's probably why it's so fresh in my mind. And she's flapping on top of the fish as they're being pulled up. And she looks not great. And the people in charge were looking at that and looking at that like, well, but that's kind of what cars are going to look like because cars are metal. We're going to have an entire film filled with reflective surface characters, and they're going to look like that. We need to solve the lighting issue. And as usual, lighting is actually an extremely complex thing, which involves a lot of work and thought and time and effort. They ended up going into this and adding ray tracing, uh, trying to use reflections and... Sorry, notification. And trying to add occlusion and irradiance to try and account for multiple shadows and creases and lines, and just to add it so that the light would reflect off of and showcase them sufficiently so they actually looked like they were cars rather than like Dory did back in the previous film. Understandable. Pretty big jump up, technologically speaking, and a decent chunk of the budget, as usual. They also had uh, another bit of tech they added. This is kind of cool here. So first of all, they... Uh, what, did I write it down? Apparently I didn't write it down. Hmm. Oh, here it is. No, ground locking. That's all they call it? Okay, whatever. So they added this brand new thing called ground locking. Now, I've talked before about how they would usually render something and then do a second and a third pass in order to track all the little details. And obviously they're still doing that, but in this case, they wanted to add something to the first pass. Usually... And by usually, I mean up until now. When they've been rendering stuff, they've been manually checking to see that objects don't intersect with other objects like the ground or a doorknob or whatever it is they're interacting with. This new tech was designed to give, uh, give structure to the ground and to the model so that they would adhere to each other but not intersect with each other. That is to say, they wouldn't clip through each other. 
And this was then used so the cars would always be grounded, so that at all points in time, they would actually be, even in just the base model before rendering, just the, um, the skeleton, it would actually be stuck on the ground, which is really cool the way they did this. This is also related to a lot of that research I mentioned earlier, where they were looking into how these cars should move, because just like with Finding Nemo, they wanted them to move like cars, not like people. But they still needed them to be expressive and to get across certain emotions and concepts, despite being vehicles. This is actually one of the biggest reasons the eyeballs were put up into the windshields, by the way. The other was pure aesthetics. So what they did was they figured out this rule. So they've got the new lighting tech. And by lighting tech, I mean multiple new tiers of lighting tech. They've got this new ground locking technology. Now they're like, okay, why don't we change... Well, why don't we come up with like a series of formulas of exactly how the skeleton moves dependent upon the make and the age of the car. Thus, a lot of the older cars literally move and animate differently than the middle cars, and the middle cars animate and move differently than the racing cars. And this variance allows for a very minor, but legitimately noticeable, especially if you're paying attention for it, variance. It's... It's one of those things I praise so much in most of fiction. Usually this is a video game thing, where there's just a tiny little thing that immediately, visually and or audibly, differentiates things from other things. It's one of the reasons why I wear a different outfit, depending on the type of show I'm doing, for example. Similar concept. So this this is all brilliant work, and I am legitimately blown away by the amount of time and attention and detail that was put into animating this work. It is legitimately technically impressive. Story-wise, the, the, supposedly this came out of Lassiter himself. Now, if, you were want, if you've been watching these ruminations so far, you already know why. If you haven't, I'll give you a really quick refresher. After working on Toy Story, which was a nightmare to get working, A Bug's Life, which he was only kind of involved in, and Toy Story 2, which was a death sentence, Lassiter was just like, Ugh. And he wasn't the only one. Quite a few of the, the original core staff who worked on all three of those films were just like, uh, and they needed a break. Lasseter himself apparently went out on some kind of big vacation with his wife and kids, and they had a road trip, and it was cool. Now, he's always been into cars in general, which I can sympathize with, because I kind of am too. I'm Formula One, you know, what can I say? <laughs> um, I, I, so, it, you know, it was kind of... It, it, he, he, the, the, the cars thing and the animation thing and the taking a breather thing all just kind of percolated into... This story idea. It's like, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? Now, <clears throat> I don't want to talk more about the story just yet, but I just wanted to talk about where that came from. It's an understandable concept. The obvious comparison to Doc Hollywood has to be made, because if I don't, then everyone in the comments will assume I just missed it for some reason. So, Doc Hollywood. Allow me to go ahead and professionally say that this isn't all that Doc Hollywood, though, to be blunt. It is Doc Hollywood in the same sense that it's the same premise. But I've seen plenty of works that have the same premise, which I wouldn't call carbon copies of each other. And frankly, uh, Doc Hollywood is also just a you know a carbon copy of what Dead Again, Dead Again, which is a book that Doc Hollywood was based off of. And that's being facetious. Obviously, it's not a carbon copy of the book. That's my point. Now, I I know this is a whole other argument we could get into. I just wanted to address it, and then throw it out the window and never think about it again. So. It's funny, my window's actually over here. I always throw things out this way, which would just go into my closet. That, that, that's not going to be very effective. That's just going to get full after a while. Get out of there. Get, uh, uh, there we go. Okay. World building. So with all this stuff done, they're like, okay, we've got the weight. We've got the animation. Oh, yeah, originally they were going to be rather bouncy. If you've ever seen old-style cartoons or if you've just played Cuphead, you kind of know what I mean by bouncy. If you don't, don't worry about it. But they looked at that and they were like, no, that looks terrible. And this also led to some other tech changes where each of the cars was designed to have a noticeable weight to it, which is also visible in the animation. Just wanted to mention that really quick. So we've got the cars. We've got the premise. Let's talk about the world building. How the hell does this world exist? This is probably the most... Huh? out there of the various world concepts that they've come up with throughout this franchise, or throughout the Pixar series, I should say. And I know that they also have planes. I mean, they do show planes that have faces and helicopters that have faces. There's a frickin' blimp. You know, 
Vehicles are people. Cool. I'm with that. Except that it makes no sense whatsoever. What's funny, though, is, and I, and I already kind of mentioned this before, and this will come up again in Cars 2, we know that the world exists. We know that there's places and people, and it, it equates to real-life Earth. So, huh? It's okay, though, because we have an answer straight from Jay Ward about this. This is actually semi-recent. Apparently, in in the future, autonomous cars got pretty advanced. Really really advanced but they didn't really need the people anymore so there's no people anymore right also the not needing people anymore thing makes no sense i I mean imagine an entire society of beings who don't have opposable digits for god's sakes your technological capacity is going to be rather severely limited don't you think but again of all of the world building, like I've tried to make sense of the world building of several of these concept pieces. This is the one I'm just hands offing. It doesn't make sense. The end. Although there was one other little tidbit I wanted to share. Apparently, the personalities of all these cars come from the last person to drive them. Which, okay, that makes sense until you think about new cars. Where do those come from? Anyways. <clears throat> so let's get to the film proper. Oh yeah, actually, real quick. This one cost $120 million and only made $460 million. Now, only, listen to me, that is still a very good return on investment. It is less than the Pixar standard, but that's still a really good sales figure. What's funny, though, is the reason Cars, with its relatively lower income, has made a franchise, whereas so many other ones haven't, is because of merchandising. The Cars merchandising has made so much money... I actually couldn't find a singular figure that I felt was accurate enough to report to you. It's definitely in the billions range, but that's about all I've got, because there's just so many conflicting reports on exactly how much has been made by what, by whom, just with regards to all the Cars toys. And yes, that means the Cars toys have sold for more than the Toy Story toys. Anyways... This was the last Paul Newman work, and this is the last Joe Rant work. Uh, both of them passed away either prior to the release or just after the release of this film, and that sucks, and I just wanted to mention that very quickly. <sighs> film proper. I already talked about uh, Doc Hollywood, so I don't have to re-cover that point. You know... Think about the size of that stadium at the beginning. Because cars are kind of big. I mean, they're not huge, but they are certainly larger than we are. And that stadium has to house as many of them as it tends to do for us. Who the heck built that thing? How did they build that thing? God, that thing's got to be gargantuan. Now, it makes a degree of sense since it's, uh, it's posited, and this also is carried forward in future films, including planes, if we're being honest, that racing is just a huge deal within this world. Remember how we talked about how the uh, the factory workers, the energy producers, the scarers, and later the laughers, over in Monsters, Inc. were the heroes, the superheroes, the, the, the sports stars of their particular setting. It makes a degree of sense in a world of cars that cars would act, you know, racing would be such a big deal. I mean, hell, racing's a big deal in real life, for God's sakes. So... <laughs> The only thing that makes me wonder is if they have other kinds of sports. Like, what would bumper cars be at that point? Or like a, a derby kind of a thing. I don't know. Anyways, it makes sense, and it makes sense that there's so much money cycling around it. We have some really quick Bugs Life moments. You know, hey, here's how cars do human things. If X were Y. I already talked about that. And then we see Chick, who does lots of stuff that should probably be illegal. They've got cameras on him, and they've got the ability to instant replay, so the fact that he gets away with stuff consistently actually kind of pisses me off, because it it drives the drama by having him basically pull a Sebulba, but Sebulba got away with it because no one was actually watching in certain moments, and, you know, he was kind of a local gangster, and it was designed, and that was like a death sport. Whereas here, he just kind of starts wrecking the, the other teams and causes an entire large pileup on purpose. That should be a career ender right there. Never mind the fact that they only pull out a yellow flag for that, for God's sakes. Anyways. <clears throat> so, 
in football terms, he should probably get a red flag for that. But that that's crossing metaphors at that point. Anywho, <clears throat> so, cool. That sucks. We also see Strip Weathers. Um, he, now, okay, this is kind of cool. Chick, Chick Hicks, the guy played by uh, Michael Keaton, he, his, his thing is covered in tiny little adverts. He has dozens and dozens of sponsors all over him. Now, of course, uh, Weathers, the king, he has one sponsor, just the one, which is obviously Dynaco. Interestingly enough, McQueen only has one sponsor, too. Little visual distinction between them, ignoring the fact that one of them is cool-headed, blue, one of them is green with envy, and one of them is a red hothead. Anyways. So he decides to go on without tires. <laughs> I don't remember the year, but I was watching a year where uh, Vettel was going around. It was on Spa. I remember the track. And he had decided not to pit. He decided to risk his tires. He was on the last lap in the lead when poof, he lost his tires. He got a did not finish. I, I just mentioned this because that's not exactly an isolated incident. It's just the one that came to my mind immediately. If it's not obvious, I am actually rather into Formula One, and I do enjoy racing quite a bit. And seeing that just made... He's decided not to get tires. Okay. <laughs> Moron. But we also see, we also mentioned he's uh, rotated his pit crew several times. He doesn't have a pit chief. You know, he works, I work alone. I race my own way. Yeah, okay, sure. Team actually bails on him. So this then starts the part of the film, which I like. I'd say it's my second least part, favorite part of the film. Because Keaton and Wilson both just sort of compete for who could be the biggest asshole. Meanwhile, while they're constantly trying to show off how terrible they are, you'll notice that Weathers over there, you know, the king, he's someone who is humble, laid back. He even offers legitimate advice to the rookie, unprompted. And he just comes over, hey, you know, I just wanted to give some thoughts on this one. So this is another interesting little tidbit. Owen uh, McQueen, sorry, Owen Wilson. McQueen plays the passive asshole. Uh, Michael Keaton, chick, plays the overt, aggressive asshole. Which is worse. Now, I know the film would have you pick chick as being worse, because you know, because he's the bad guy. He's the closest thing to a villain this film has. This could be another film which is argued to not have a central villain, by the way. And I, I could see that. You could also say chick is the villain. That's uh, it's debatable. But uh, my point is that... Even though the film clearly slants it one way, I kind of think I dislike McQueen more. Because that kind of snarky, passive-aggressive assholery bothers me more than someone who's just being a dick to my face, you know? That's just me, and as ever, curious of your thoughts. Either way, he has a big daydream sequence, first daydream sequence, by the way. And we find out that he doesn't want to deal with sponsors because he's got this image thing. A little quick side note. Uh, they mentioned, they, they briefly mentioned how they've given him the body he has. That's why he doesn't actually have headlights. That's also why he doesn't, well, that's one of the reasons why he doesn't have rearview mirrors, although that's actually kind of an interesting thing for later. Uh, racing cars generally don't have rearview mirrors. but they, And they point this out with uh, Mater in a scene, too. But in a deleted scene, they, they ripped the core. They, they basically put McQueen in a new body in a, a roller pin or whatever you call it, the thing that actually lays out the roads, and kept his core essence in the new body. Now, to my knowledge, this idea has not re resurfaced in Cars 2 or in Cars 3. It does show up kind of over in Planes, which isn't actually by Pixar, we're not covering it. The idea that as long as you keep the core person, it doesn't matter what their shell is or what their, their what is built around them. You can just do whatever with it. I don't know how true that is, and I don't know how much that's expressed, but that was clearly the original idea and drove several aspects of the plot early on as well. Either way, that's all deleted scene stuff, so it doesn't really count. I just thought I'd mention it because it is still implied with the idea that his chassis was funded by these Rusties guys who he can't stand. <laughs> Even though they're the ones that gave him his big shot, and he is apparently good enough to actually make a go of it. So naturally, he wouldn't give a damn about them because they're just getting in his way. I mean, they make me look bad. 
I really want to slug this guy. And I know he's a car, so he can take it. At least a couple times. Visuals. Congested roads. Lots, uh, lots of condensed areas. But the next thing I want to comment on is something that I have mentioned before. It is once again a showcasing of the animation bumps that they've had in the past. Now, Incredibles is probably actually the first really, really good time they've showed off this particular bump. And that is the terrain bump, specifically. Being able to show off lots of different terrain shots is something that they just couldn't do in the older days. And now are doing semi-regularly. Think about how many distance shots and how many... Uh, Long poles across the road as it's going across the country, as it gets more into suburbia and then it gets into out of the rural, uh, urban, uh, out of the urban area, excuse me, into the rural area, gets onto the highway, and then we see the actual whole area around Radiator Springs, etc., etc. You get the idea. All of that stuff is once again showcasing the excellent work with terrain, and it is pretty gorgeous. Credit where credit is due. So this then leads to a nice little tidbit. Hey, you get 20 free tickets. You have no friends, of course. I want you to remember this point. I'm going to bring it up later. So then Mac wants to stop at the truck stop because he's tired. Because, of course, a truck stop would just be a place where the trucks can sleep overnight. Yeah, that, that, that tracks. And McQueen continues to be an asshole. He just can't stop himself, can he? One more smack. Uh, he insists that Mac drives through the night, which is not only kind of a dick move, but legitimately dangerous. This leads to the punks who get him to sleep. Hang on, hang on. Let's let's go down the list here, shall we? So, he forces Mac to, dr to drive, so Mac gets tired, so the punks try to mess with him because they're punks. That's what punks do. That's why they call them punks. Anti-establishment, man, you can't drive on this road. I don't know why they speak with that voice, but they do. It's totally true. You can look it up. It's been documented in photos. And then they, they so <laughs> then they rush away. And that's uh, the one guy sneezes, which wakes Mac up, which startles the cab. Oh, and by the way, before this, one of his toys dropped down to knock down the thing so that the, the aft would open. And then McQueen falls out. And then McQueen still stays asleep for a bit until he's woken up. And then he races off a little bit too late to just catch up to Mac immediately. Then he sees another <laughs> semi or Laurie, if you prefer, going off of the, the highway and thinks that has to be Mac, but then he has to race the train in order to get past it, in order to find him, and finds out that it's not him because he doesn't have his headlights, so he can't actually see it. And now he's lost, so it's okay, no problem. But then he gets he's, he's racing through trying to find his way back to this interstate. The cop comes after him, and he's like, oh, thank God, I can just ask the cop for help, which actually is pretty legit. But no, the cop is having... Uh, Afterburn, or not after, what do you call that? The, when, when the engine's firing badly. I can't think of what it's called. Which means he thinks the cop is actually shooting at him, which, by the way, implies that guns exist in this setting. We'll see that again in Cars 2. Which then leads to shenanigans and destroying half the town and tearing up the road, which leads to him getting tangled up in the power lines. And, okay, we did it. We got him. We got him stuck in Radiator Springs. <laughs> I understand full well the creative difficulties in writing. I do. I get it. I've been analyzing fiction for over a decade now. But this is one of the most convoluted path paths from point A to point B I've ever seen in fiction. This is nonsense. It's it's not actually funny. It's just funny when you sit back and think about it, which is why I'm just kind of chuckling now. It's like, okay. Meanwhile, we see the quiet town. Which is so quiet. I mean, I, I, quiet ceases to be a good word here. This place is devoid. There's nothing going on here. These people are just sitting there. Of course, places like this do exist in real life. In fact, uh, I've been to a couple, uh, not not recently, but in the past, where they are so off the grid that in many cases you won't even have you know signal on your phone if you happen to have it with you. So they're just they're just over there and unseen, unheard. We get a quick shot of some commercials. Oh my god, where's McQueen? Then Hudson sees McQueen and on sight. Nope, I'm done. Get him out of here. Okay, you got that one, film. I will give you that. That is some good foreshadowing. It's probably some of the only good foreshadowing in the entire film. Because 
he is so oh, immediately aggravated by the very sight of the very thing that he loved so much that was for that that abandoned him that turned on him that wound is so visible immediately then sally comes in once again by bonnie hunt she just likes to do pixar stuff doesn't she and sally is like no let's go do a whole thing this then leads to probably the worst scene in the entire film with some of the most awkward terrible egotistical blah I, flirting i have to, i have to do the the quotes there because this is not don't flirt like this don't do this don't do this um it's just terrible crap and the whole court sequence is just kind of bleh although i do want to mention one thing hudson only has one rear view mirror i'll give you that one film they even call attention to it briefly so he bails. They, you know, obviously he was low on gas. How did he not know? Does he not have gas indicators somewhere within his consciousness so that he would know that he was low on gas? Obviously not, because he just guns it. Either that or he's a moron, which I suppose would make make sense. Now, what what follows is a whole lot of blah. My notes get a lot more threadbare from this point on, because we are now entering the bad part of the film if i might be so bold about it and i'm going to try and talk about this this is my gerb and i'm going to try to do this as professionally as i can but i have to comment on one thing how many of you all follow european racing how many of you all follow north american racing now no judgment my dad actually likes nascar but um what I find most amusing about this is I have seen many times a pseudo feud between, you know, European racing and American racing and how both sides think the other is drivel in one way or another. You know, it's, it's one of those things. Now, I've never seen this escalate into actual antagonizement. It's usually just kind of a light poking. Oh, yeah, sure. It's really hard to turn left repeatedly, which is, of course, dismissive because it's actually legitimately very hard to, to do the turns that they do in NASCAR or Oh yeah, sure. You got to have all those wheels and, and and parts there in order to try and make sure that you just drive around at the head of the pack, and there's no excitement to it, which of course is also dismissive and doesn't get across the point. And you get the idea, the, the little the rivalry thing. So the little tidbit they threw into this very film, where they were like, "Oh yeah, you're a racer. That's great. How huh? would you?" I only follow European racing. <laughs> that got a laugh out of me. The last laugh I had for about forty minutes. So, we have the legitimately creepy, desperate sellers, and we have our second Dynaco dream, and uh, you, does it, why do people find Mater funny? Legitimate question. Does anybody out there find Mater funny? Not Larry the Cable Guy. I'm not talking about a stand-up act, although... By the way, he was brought into this and allowed to riff most of his lines, so most of his lines are ad-libbed, because uh, Lasseter loved his stand-up act so much. Make it that what you will. I don't find him funny. And that's one of those problems, is if, you, if there is a comedy work which you don't find funny, then not only is it not enjoyable, it's actively unenjoyable, because it starts pushing into the negative territory. And that's just a huge chunk of this for me. And that brings me to the next big point. When do you think Pixar tanked? When do you think they descended? <sighs> Let me explain that really quick. This is one of those common topics. I see people, I see geeks of many types discuss this all the time. When do you think such and such sports team or game developer or writer or producer or company or uh, television series or movie series or franchise like Star Wars, when did Star Wars get bad? When did Star Wars die for you? You know, you, you've, you've heard those topics and you've heard those discussions, I'm sure. I would bet money most of you have participated in them. I kind of hinted at this before. When do you think Pixar started going down in quality? And I've heard several different answers to this. Um, obviously, Mr. Eisner thought it was going to be Finding Nemo. Of course, he was thinking purely financially. Some people think it's Good Dinosaur, for example, which is the first noticeably financial dip in sales of the Pixar films. Some people think it's Cars 2. Some people think it was further on and onward. I've heard some people say that it was as far back as Toy Story 2. What's your answer? The mere fact that I'm bringing this up here gives away my answer. This is a 
noticeable dip in quality in filmmaking and in scripting and just in general. As much as I praised the quality of the animation earlier, which I stand by, this is a technically impressive film, this was not enjoyable to watch up until a certain point. And I want you to remember that asterisk for later, okay? Just, hmm. So what we have here is just a bunch of really, really typical Hollywood stuff. We have the dream sequences. We have the asshole. Um, we have people. There's the, it feels like an arc should be here, like a character arc from a queen, but there isn't. He's just kind of a dick, but then because of the fact that he's doing his job, people are inspired by that in order to start cleaning up a little bit and improving the town, painting the fences, you know, etc. And she just starts openly flirting with him for some reason. And this leads me to romance. Now, erroneously, I have a reputation for being anti-romance in fiction and in real life. That is not true. I'm actually a hell of a romantic myself, if I might be so bold. But the problem is, I tend to be a romantic. In other words, the type of romance I tend to seek in real life and as well as in fiction is something with a little more concreteness to it than just your typical Hollywood romance. Now, I have spoken out against this concept for years, but ultimately most of the stuff I've seen has not really been that bad. Some of it has. There's been the occasional tidbits, especially over in the Trek stuff where, you know, the romance of the week is a regular concept. But this... This is what I personally consider to be bottom of the barrel. Not Cars specifically. The type of thing Cars is doing. This is your bog standard 101 textbook Hollywood romance. There is a person. There's another person. Usually male and female. Because Hollywood. And the two of them are like, oh, we hate each other. Mwah, mwah, mwah. And then they, then they fall in love. Because they're there. If one of the most common jokes I hear is, why are they, why are these two people together? Oh, because they're both single and attractive. And that's as far as that goes. Or because they're the main characters. Or just because it's so checkboxy. There's no buildup. There's no development. There's no chemistry. There's no attachment. There's no emotional investment. There's no physical investment. It's just, you two are in love now. Have fun. And that aggravates the hell out of me. That this, this concept right here is why I started becoming known to be anti-romance and fiction. Because of this crap, which I am very against. Forgive me for ranting about this. Now, <sighs> I just, so we've got the unfunniness. We've got the bad romance. Then they start doing fart jokes. And that was the official moment I just realized, oh my god, what am I watching? This then leads to something that, in I would argue, has not been in a Pixar film to date. Padding. Straight up filling out the runtime with nothing. Nothing entertaining, nothing interesting, nothing developing, no character moments, no world building, no enjoyment, no awesome, no cool, no fun. Just wasted time. Tractor tipping is one of the examples. There's actually several. I just wanted to name one of those examples. This is also when they call out the rearview mirror thing. And then we have our third dream, third freaking dream sequence. You'll note, I'm, I made a note here that says no emotional beats. Up until this point in the film, nothing has hit me emotionally at all. And that's kind of one of Pixar's wheelhouses, right? They can make me feel. I mean, hell, Finding Nemo hit me like a tr ton of bricks. I, I wasn't even expecting that one. <sighs> now, then, <laughs> then we see the first redeeming feature of McQueen. It's the first time he's been portrayed as anything other than an unrepentant asshole. He has genuine enthusiasm for racing. That would have been an excellent character arc for him, wouldn't it? Follow the rookie who's full of himself, but ultimately is just putting up a front because he's a rookie. He doesn't have the actual experience to back it up. So while he's arrogant, he's ultimately just a kid who really loves racing, who really got into racing because of how much he loves racing. 
Hell, you could have dropped hints about this earlier, about him. You could have mentioned the Hornet. You could have said it like that to make sure nobody gets it. Just, oh, my God, yeah, and the Hornet just, oh, my dad was doing this. And, of course, the Hornet is about two generations before him. We actually hear a line later that Weathers, the king, was inspired to take a bracing by Hudson. So you could have done stuff with this. You could have built up to this. And that is my major point here. I was going to talk about this later. But I think this is the best time to talk about it. The last mm, 20-ish minutes of the film are good. I know, weird. No one was more surprised than me as I'm sitting here, literally just sitting in my chair like this, watching it. And all of a sudden, it started hitting character beats. And all of a sudden, it started hitting narrative beats. And I'm like, wait, what? And it was confusing. But the problem is, it is completely unearned. The first hour and change, I think it's like hour and 15, hour and 30, something like that. The first hour plus is just wasted time and doesn't actually build up. There's no establishment. You remember how I praised the crap out of Monsters, Inc. for doing so much establishment so we could understand and get on board and, and, and okay, I'm with it, I'm with it, I'm with it. And then they could actually do something with it, which they did. This is the exact opposite of that. In fact, there's another Pixar film I'm reminded here, reminded of here, Onward. Now, if you were present for my stream where I discussed Onward, I already said this, and I'm going to probably say this when we get to that actual rumination, but Onward had some really cool moments and some really good character and story bits at the very end of the film. And and it was unearned. There was no buildup. There was no establishment. There was no anything. I'm repeating myself because I feel like I'm not even getting across how bad this is. Please forgive me. I'll try not to repeat myself anymore. But I'll try not to repeat myself anymore as I talk about just how lacking this is. (sighs) At one hour and seven minutes is the first time the supposed theme of the film actually shows up. The you should slow down and take your time. You remember how I talked about that earlier with Lasseter's big thing? I say supposed theme because this is yet another example where the creators say the theme of work is something, and I just completely disagree with that. That actually happens a lot to me. I, I don't know if I'm just an idiot or what, but I don't agree that that's the theme of this film. At best, it is a tertiary theme. <sighs> so, um... They talk about the idea of the highway. They get really blatant with this. The highway doesn't go with the terrain. It just goes through the terrain. Uh huh. <laughs> Smashing my face in with a hammer. And you know, they really hammer in the turn trick. They keep emphasizing that over and over. Hudson was abandoned by his team. Yeah, sure he was. I'm just, I, I mean, come on, really? Given how many people are still huge fans of Hudson, they, they really abandoned the Hornet. Sure, sure they did. And this probably leads to McQueen's actual turnaround. Like I said, this is 100% unearned. And in fact, as I was paying attention, there was one bit of foreshadowing for this in the entire film. One. Contrast, I hate to keep comparing this to Monsters, Inc. Monsters, Inc., which had a bevel of wonderful, well-designed, and variety of obviousness, like some were pretty subtle, some were pretty overt, uh, build up to the big, to the reveal and the foreshadowing and the blah, 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 blah. Try not to repeat myself, but <laughs> they had one scene where McQueen was upset because he didn't have any friends. 20 free tickets, can't bring anyone. Remember I mentioned that? So he runs around and he starts buying stuff and Okay, I gotta admit, the retro look actually looks good on his chassis. It does. But I have that kind of sense of uh, sensibility. I actually wrote down my favorite models here just really quick, because we got the 62-250 GTO, which is a gorgeous car. Then we got the Shelby 260, gotta have the Cobra. And, of course, the 67 Corvette, the L88. Those are some gorgeous cars. So I admit, I'm a little bit biased here towards the style, but he does look good, and I'll give you that one. Also, we find out that gas companies are conspiring. Oh, my God. Could you imagine? But here's the thing I will give this scene. This is when I started to enjoy the film. Because ultimately, this is the Toy Story thing again. 
each of these vehicles has their own particular career path that they have clearly stuck to because that's what they're good at and that's what they want to do. It's not about the sales. It's not. In fact, it could be argued there's no actual currency in this setting because it hasn't even been brought up yet. No, obviously there is some kind of currency because they talk about buying and transaction. But my point is, it's not about the money. It's about doing what you're into. It's about fulfilling your purpose, about actually accomplishing something and being happy with it. This is the secondary film theme of the film. Remember how I mentioned the, the take your time thing is the tertiary thing? The secondary theme would be we have our things and those things bring us happiness, legitimate happiness. Sally says this flat out. She had money and wealth. I mean, she's a Porsche, for God's sakes. She had money and wealth. She just drove out here, kind of broke down, was taken in, and she stayed here because it brought her happiness. It became her core. I know I talk about that concept all the time, but again, I think it is very applicable here. Each of these people has found their core in this little town. That's why they stay. That's why they do. That's why they're so excited to change the tires. That's why they're so, so excited to, to, to be like, oh God, maybe I should do this or that. And here's my organic fuel and, and here's the, the friggin' towing service and yada, 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 yada. So what McQueen is doing is encouraging them to do what it is they love to do so that they can get that little bit of happiness again. I'll give you that one. Like I said, this one, the film suddenly starts being good because, well, the next thing that happens, other than them scraping the road, which pisses me off, is the main theme. You can call this what you'd like. Um, I call it connections. The connections between people. You know, my friends are my power is how this usually gets said, but it is still a true statement here. We see that Hudson... Well, I should have start. I should have led with him. Um, we see McQueen is all alone. We see Chick is all alone. We see Hudson is all alone, and all three of them are miserable for it in their own ways, and they all know it to differing extents, except for Chick, who has no self awareness. Contrast this towards the town, and probably most importantly, Weathers. What do we consistently see with Weathers, the king? Well, he's got his wife there. And he's got the, the sponsor, and he's got his people who are just his friends. By virtue of actually having that community, having those connections between people, they feel like their lives are enriched by it. This, of course, is made most obvious by the fact that McQueen has, has thrown out so many different pit crews and pit chiefs, to the point where during the film, one of them actually bails on him because he is that just aggravating to deal with making him alone. The only one he had was Mac, and remember, Mac's actually working for the agent, and the agent's a horrible human being. Excuse me, a horrible car. We never even see him. That's the funny part. There's even a bit, oh, he's actually here? No, it's, ju it's just the phone call in the back of the truck. Immediate contrast with Sally, who's right there, and he doesn't want to lose his connection with her. Romance, romance. But it's still a connection, an actual legitimate connection. And when he's driving away, what does he look at? The, the people in the town that he's leaving behind. And he is so enthused and happy when they come to support him in the race. Because that's what makes him happy, is racing. But it only makes him happy when he's with his people, his community. There's the actual themes of the film. And you can see why I suddenly start enjoying the film right in these last 20 minutes. It's because all of a sudden these two themes start really coming to the forefront and it starts actually hitting these character beats. If they had been earned, if this had been properly... i got to come up with a new phrase. I don't have a thesaurus in front of me. Um, if the groundwork had been laid, then this would be a brilliant road. Instead, someone was just laying down tar. Brilliant tar! on dirt. And that's just, it, no. <laughs> or mud might even be a better example, you know? It's just all of a sudden, here's a good road. Where did this come from? So while I will give them some credit, I still just, ugh. Now, McQueen really does have a real daydreaming problem, doesn't he? He's in the middle of the race and he's daydreaming. I will say this, Mater made me laugh once. It's actually one of the only times I laughed in this whole film. Hudson? Oh, uh, yeah, I had to come. Mater didn't get a chance to say goodbye. Goodbye! Okay, I'm good. <laughs> that actually got a laugh out of me. 
I would have loved it. They're like, all right, now we're heading out. He's, no, 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 wait, wait, <laughs> please, I need you. Um, they do a pit stop. Now, this is going to sound like the dumbest thing I've probably ever geeked out about, but really good pit stops are a wonder. If you've ever seen them, again, I'll go from Formula One because that's what I'm most familiar with. They are marvels how quickly they just <laughs> gun gone. I actually looked it up. Unfortunately, I haven't seen this one. But back in 2019 in Brazil, Verstappen had a 1.82 second. 1.82 second pit stop. That's nuts. I've seen a few two seconders and three seconders in my time too. And it is, it's crazy seeing how fast they do that. Now, this one's about five seconds, but it's also being done by one person. So you got me there too, film. Winning's nice. Winning's fun. Sportsmanship, that tends to get clicks, for lack of a better way to put it. That tends to get attention. You'll notice he is offered the Dynaco thing by virtue of his sportsmanship. And, I mean, anybody who has followed any major sport can probably think of at least one major incident of a thing where one person just, just abandoned the race or the game or whatever to help out someone else because sportsmanship. I bet you could think of at least one if you're a sports geek of any type. Because it's a fairly common thing that gets a lot of attention because of how well that kind of thing tends to sell. See the Finding Nemo argument for the same thing. So he pushes him over. He gets his helicopter ride. Michael Schumacher's in the film. Oh my god. What I consider to be one of the greatest Formula One races of all time. I'd say probably the second greatest Formula race. No, that's just my opinion. I know I'm not, I'm not super great on that. It, I mean, it's, it's a Ferrari. Um, and then we have the credit sequence, which, okay, that's that's probably the third time I laughed, because we have Cars Toy Story, then we have Cars Monsters, Inc., and then we have Cars Bugs Life. Can we make that a thing? Can we do that? Like, not the whole film, just like a short story version of each of those films, except it's Cars. I think that actually might be not terrible. I don't know. But it needs to have... Lots and lots of car puns, like just a pun storm of car puns. Then I think, then I think it would work. This is a weirdly bipolar film to go through. While these are not reviews, if I was reviewing this, this would probably review as kind of below average, you know, uh, green on the scale. Because what the hell? The first over half of the film was so aggravating and irritating that I was actually shocked at how bad it was. Which then made it even more surprising when the film suddenly actually got good. I do firmly think this is when Pixar started losing their touch. Which is funny, because this is right before Disney really started actually getting involved. Which we will be talking about next time.